Hello? Hello? Uh, Professor Devadhar here. Yeah, hi, Professor Devadhar. I am Nandini Sengupta. I'm Dr. Nandini Sengupta from Economics Department of KC College. All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let me just switch on my video. Yeah, we are waiting for Niranjan, sir. Yeah. Uh, still, people are coming in. So maybe another two minutes, we will start. Yeah, I'm in no hurry. I thought I'll just check everything is OK. And uh, yeah, everything is so fine. he will speak for half an hour, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah there sir he is. Has just come. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Welcome, Dr. Niranjan Hiranandani, sir. Hello? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Niranjan, sir. So, Good afternoon to you. Thank you very much. It's such Good a pleasure. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, we are back at the webinar. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, sir, uh, Professor Deodhar is also there. He has also joined yes. in just now. Uh, Professor, Professor Sajish Deodhar. He's also most happy to be with you together, Professor Deodhar. Yeah, sure. Good afternoon. Yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining this uh, webinar. It's really nice of you to do so. Thank you. 
No, the feeling is mutual. Uh, I heard you yesterday on TV as well. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Yes. Right. Uh, right. And, and the unfortunate part is that the finance minister is going to be on the uh, on a call now in four o'clock. So yes. we're going to have a round of uh, discussion and tonight it appears, but though the uh, we don't know what the contents are. So it's right. all a bit of a Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Niranjan sir and Professor Satish Devda. This is Dr. Himlata Bagla. Hello. Principal Casey College. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello, sir. Wonderful having you with us. I see Dr. Garji also. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. And uh, good afternoon, Dr. Nandini, sir. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, Dr. Nandini, can we start the program? Yes, yes, we'll start. Uh, so good afternoon, all of you, and welcome back again to the second day of our national webinar COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in today's session, we have two very eminent uh, speakers, uh, our provost of HSNC University of Mumbai, uh, Dr. Niranjan Hiranananda, and uh, Professor Satish Deodhar from IIM Ahmedabad. Uh, so uh, I would request our principal, Dr. Hemlata Bagla, to say a few words and start the session. Good afternoon, everyone, once again. Friends, I welcome each one of you today to the second day of the national webinar on the economic reality of COVID-19, the Indian perspective. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Niranjan Hiranandani, the Honorable Provost of HSNC University, Mumbai, and Dr. Satish Devdhar, Professor of Economics, I am Ahmedabad, for the respective sessions on the topic impact of COVID-19 on Indian economy. The pandemic and consequent lockdown has hit various sectors, including MSME, hospitality, construction, civil aviation, agriculture, and allied sectors. As the president of several industry bodies, like SOCHAM and NADECO, our provost of HSNC University, Dr. Niranjan Yanakani, has been extremely vocal in giving constructive suggestions to the government for managing the economic stress which has been unleashed by the COVID-19 pandemic. He has voiced his concern over the last three to four weeks and had estimated rightly that the economy will require a fiscal stimulus of at least 14 lakh crores to manage and restart the economy post-COVID. The Honorable Prime Minister, sir, in his speech a day before has agreed to provide a stimulus of around 20 lakh crores to make India Atam Nirbhar Bharat, that is a self-reliant India. I'm sure Dr. Hiranandani is happy that the government has taken note of his additions and some have been incorporated in phase one of the package, which was announced by the Honorable Finance Minister recently. The measures pertaining to MSMEs and creation of liquidity and assistance echo some of the Dr. Hiranandani's suggestions. I'm sure the second phase of reforms, uh, which is likely to be announced shortly, will also resonate with his ideas and thoughts on the subject. We, sir, uh, we are indeed privileged to have uh, you with us today to share your reflections on the impact of COVID on Indian economy. It's my pleasure to invite the Honorable Provost of HSNC University, Mumbai, to deliver his opening address today. Over to Dr. Niranjan Hiranandani. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much, Principal Hemlata Bagla. Thank you for giving me this privilege of speaking to you on this occasion. Uh, I'm really honored also to have along with me in the panel, Dr. Satish Deodhar, an eminent professor from IIM Ahmedabad, and I'm really happy that we share the dais, uh, though remotely, on this webinar. Uh, the, the last... Uh, two days in terms of the economics of India has suddenly seen a different turn. Till today, it was industry and business and the media, which were actually moving up towards the prime minister, to the finance minister and other government agencies in order to see what is it that is required beyond Jahan. Jahan ke saath, Jahan bhi chahiye. Aur iske liye hum koshis kar rahe the. We were trying to do it. 
But the Prime Minister, of course, surprised us because he went still further because he created the vision for India, not just an economic stimulus, but a vision, a direction. And he spoke about the foundation in which he wants to go. And he talked about Atma Nirvarta, he talked about Atma Bhal and Atma Vishwas. He talked about that India should now take this opportunity of taking this whole COVID situation into a new direction. And he gave five platforms under which he wants to take this forward. The first, for, uh, the first platform which he suggested was the economy platform. The second, infrastructure. The third, technology driver. The fourth, the demographics for the young population of India. And the fifth, the demand, the demand through the supply chain economics of this country. These were the five main platforms that he wanted to start with. The finance minister, Madam Nirmala Sitaramji, also took this very much forward and talked about the same, talked about the platform and said that she would have five different thought process pillars to take the same thought of the prime minister forward. And after saying all this, she talked about land, labor, liquidity, law, and some other matter, which I'm forgetting. All these platforms and columns that were created were the benchmarks to take economy into a new direction. How do we do it? Did we need any stimulus whatsoever? This was a big question which was being debated. There was also the FRBM Act, which said you don't spend so much, otherwise the country will have other problems which are going to come with it. So a huge debate raged on the economic side as to what is the right direction that we go. Do we go on a position where we do a fair fiscal stimulus? which is of a very strong order, as was thought of and done in the United States of America, Japan, and other Western countries? Or do we go on the conservative approach of saying that we do not need a stimulus? This was heavily debated in the media, and there were various pros and cons which came both from the World Bank and other economists of India including the ex-governors of the Reserve Bank of India. All these debates went on and back and forth when we in our industrial platforms recommended 14, as Madam Bagla just said, that there should be a stimulus package of 14 lakh crores of rupees. This was on the platform of Asocham. Again, these were debated figures and we were told that these are too aggressive a figure for India to really match this situation. However, the Prime Minister has taken one step forward and after taking consultations from all various people have decided that the figure which should be of a stimulus package, the economic package to revive the situation post COVID should be of the range of 20 lakh crores. What did she start with? She started with an area which actually was suffering a lot, the MSME, the medium, small, and micro enterprises of India needed a injection, an IV, to bring it back into normal. And the biggest amount of money which was put in in the first tranche of this was three lakhs seventy thousand crores. Three lakhs was a collateral free loan to be given to MSME. Again, unprecedented, never happened before with a 100% guarantee by the central government. And a 20,000 crores, a partial guarantee for SMEs which are good. And for those which are very good, a fund of funds of 50,000 crores for them to benchmark with the best. All this was the first tranche, 3 lakh 7,000 crores out of a total budget of 20 lakh crores that was done. The second tranche which was discussed was another sector which has been suffering, which is the NBFCs. NBFCs in the last two years have gone through lots of difficulties. And the final nail in the coffin of many NBFCs was the, the difficult 
which took place with ILFS, the infrastructure leasing company, which went under. After that, NBFCs have not received funding and hence a guarantee scheme and a partial guarantee scheme totaling to 75,000 crores of rupees have been allocated by the finance minister for the purposes of funding through, through, through guarantees and through partial guarantees in the NBFC space. NBFCs also lend a lot of money to uh, SMEs and hence this would be a double whammy for the SMEs because they would now be possible to get direct funding under collateral and uh, guarantee by the central government and also for others would be able to get it from the NBFCs. This was very important as a next leg of financing to be done. The third leg of financing done by the finance minister has been payments which they are supposed to do, but they didn't do in the past. They, because of the monopolistic situation, got away with murder. But this is an opportune time to pay the people they owe the money to. Discoms of India, the power producers, uh, did not pay only 90,000 crores. This time, Madam Nirmala Sitaraman has promised that this entire amount will be paid as early as possible. There are other payments which have not been done yet, which is income tax refunds, refunds in terms of GST, and other payments which the central government is to be done. For non-corporate loans, for non-corporate refunds, um, the finance minister has committed that those payments will be done. And I think that's an important segment of the economy. What does it all mean? It all means that the economy is in such a dire state that till you don't give an infusion of a stimulus, that the economy will not come back to normal. What does the, what does the uh, IMF say? What does the World Bank say about what is the position of the economy today? The last report, which was released by the World Bank, stated that our economy, instead of 4.5% or 5% GDP growth, is going to fall to around 1.9% growth. My view was that it could have gone into a negative rate of growth, or at least a real rate of growth, which would be negative for the first time in the annals of Indian history, at least in my lifetime of business, it would be the first time. However, this is exactly what the prime minister and the finance minister wants to mitigate. They want to see that this negative rate should not happen. Not only should it be 1.9, but I think we can push to a positive rate of growth. Another important factor mentioned by the prime minister was the fact that we would like to see that in future, India should become self-reliant. A lot of statements have been made wherein the government machinery, including the defense forces, will buy more from India, made in India, and the focus would be that. Lots of issues and discussions have taken place in the media and that we have an opportunity that companies which desire to leave China would come into India. This seems to be easy to say, but difficult to do. The last 42 companies which have intent to leave China who have made statements, more than 23 of them actually want to go to Vietnam, not India. And out of these 42, only two are contemplating to come to India. So there are lots of things that we need to do in order to make the change. The states of UP and Madhya Pradesh last week have done a revolutionary change in the labor laws in order to see that the requirements of labor by international companies, the fluctuating requirements of labor will be there. The migrant laborers, which are coming from UP, Madhya Pradesh, Bengal, and Bihar, and other parts to Western India and Southern India for the purposes of jobs and occupancies for their livelihood, will have an opportunity in UP because that's the draw which is expected now. 
So a competitiveness will now come up in the rest of India as to which are the states which actually will be able to draw business and industry into this country. So yes, there are opportunities, lots and lots of opportunity. But are we in India ready for such opportunities? Are we making the environment good and ready for the purposes of receiving these people? Will these investors, people who are manufacturing, come to India or will they go to Bangladesh and other countries? The last migration two years ago of textile units which left China did not come to India. Funnily, even Indian entrepreneurs set up the factories in Bangladesh. So a large amount of industry of textiles in the last two years, which left China, moved into Bangladesh. And that is the sad part of the story because we are grossly overconfident that because they leave China, they will come to settle to India. Yes, India has many advantages. English speaking to a great extent in terms of doing the judiciary and the law, uh, that is an equal advantage. The third, we have a situation wherein democracy has been there in the country. All these factors are a big positive. However, business and industry looks at so many factors before they decide to come to a country. And hence, we become equal opportunity and competitiveness to all. I think the idea being that today, as we have talked about, in the next one hour, we are going to hear Nirmala Sitaramji, our finance minister, to speak about other opportunities in terms of the fiscal package, which is going to come to India. My gut feel is that the migrant and poor labor and poorer classes of this country are probably going to be one of the targeted segments which he will attend to. They have been the ones which have feared the most and treated the worst by our leaders. I am quite surprised that while we send aeroplanes to receive people from abroad, we, we make people of our own country walk 500, 1000, 1200 kilometers to go back to their homes. I think this has been one of the biggest mistakes where we will have to learn from that we cannot afford to treat our own citizens in our country in this manner. I do hope that our leadership will not make this mistake again. However, I guess the situation of COVID is so terrible and the need for saving lives so imperative and so needy that we have in the lockdown situation saved many, many, many lives. And I think that is something which only our prime minister could do. The leadership that he has shown in terms of a lockdown situation, which is to save lives at the first instance in order that our health, uh, our hospitals and other institutions to look after the health of the people are made in preparedness for the spread of virus and to flatten the curve. So till we do not get a vaccine in order to save our population, the only way is segregating distance, a lockdown situation and similar such activity to isolate the people. Fortunately for us, the effect of this virus has been very kind in the sense that the mortality rate is extremely low. However, it's very, very, very contagious. It's much more contagious than the flu and the SARS disease which had spread earlier. So I think the health situation and the whole. But today, there could be a lot of people dying out of poverty and lack of food. But we have another opportunity. For the first time, we have grossly excess food in our granaries. It has never happened before that we have so much grain in our granaries that we can feed our population for two years with a kind of saving and with a good harvest which has just come in. Uh, it would be even easy to feed a lot of these poor through the food grain measures that could be done. It could be one of those opportunity which actually really looks forward to have it. I think the situation also merits to say 
how do we take this deadly virus and use this lockdown situation to a positive angle rather than a negative angle? Because every situation like this is also an opportunity. Let's not make it into a lost opportunity. Let me give you the example of what the HSNC board has done in the last 45 to 50 days. A complete sea chain has taken place wherein complete online teaching, online coaching, online recording of this thing, preparation for online examinations in the future, and to see how education in the board can be continued in spite of the lockdown situation. This has really been a sea change in terms of education and methodologies to teach, methodologies to learn, the technical significance of using that new range of technology available, including the Zoom one, which we are using just now, I think is extremely useful to us in order to learn it. So all this when converted into a positive opportunity rather than a negative thought will always remind us that yes, this was one of the most horrible periods of Indian history, but the people, as the prime minister said, are daring, will become self-sufficient, will think about using technology to set up the new pillars of making a new India and use this good time that we have locked up in our homes to make a new India. Are we ready for it? Are we going to take it as a positive sign or are we going to sink and cry in the situation that we are? I think we are a brave nation and I think the people of India will stand up, A, to look after the health of the people, especially the older generation, the people with comorbidity, and we will take this forward. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share with you what I have understood of the economic situation. I am not an economist like Mr. Deodar, but since I'm a part of industry and business, I have taken the liberty of explaining what we have understood in business and industry of the economic situation. We will, of course, hear Professor Satish Deoda in terms of how the economists look at all the situation that we have. And I'm sure that at the end of this seminar, we'll have a lot of more learning than you have today. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Bagla, for this opportunity to speak to all of you. And I'm looking forward to a lot more interaction and thank you for creating the first uh, webinar series for the new university that has happened. I'm extremely grateful to you, your entire team. God bless you. Do well, be healthy, and be great. And make this into a change and paradigm that we will remember forever, that this was a time when we used this opportunity of lockdown to make a new university, but also a new India. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, thank you so much for such an enlightening talk. Uh, and first of all, let me thank you for the faith you reposed in uh, Casey College and me and my entire team to take this uh, university forward. And it's because of your support and your faith in us. And let me assure you, uh, you uh, are the one who is leading from the front. We only can promise you that making this university into one aspiring one where all the students uh, look up to you, look up to teachers, and they are ready for the change and, and ready to face a challenge also. So, sir, uh, uh, it is really, I mean, I, I really I was touched uh, uh, with your thoughts and I always get touched when I always get touched when I see you talking on different channels. But uh, today, when you said, John, ke sahab, jahan bhi chahiye, with the, with the, with the uh, sincerity and the emotion, uh, we respect it all. Yes, uh, you rightly pointed out that monetary and uh, fiscal measures will have to be sharp in their focus and uh, also industry specific uh, to revive the economy. And government uh, must take, uh, must continue to take measures to feed and protect and help people reach their destination. And it was really, really rightly pointed that uh, we are, we are. Uh, picking up people or fetching people from different countries and sending airplanes and we are not able to reach out to people who are on the streets 
uh, and they are hungry and they have to walk 1500 kilometers on barefoot, I feel that is what your concern. And I hope uh, all the suggestions will be taken up by the government. You have been very, very sharp enough and clear enough to send out the message. Yes, we are living in tough times and this is going to be survival of the fittest. So while disruptions uh, are, are, are multiplying, opportunities to sprout, you rightly pointed out uh, that equal opportunity for all and competitiveness, competitiveness to all. And we are not supposed to lose opportunity out here. It's going to change the way of doing business uh, for many in India. As new avenues open up, I think India has to redefine its business plan. And you are there to guide us uh, at every stage and in guide India being uh, president of SOCHAM and president of uh, NADECO and now provost of the university. So thank you so much, sir. It was uh, really, uh, uh, we are delighted to have you amidst us. You were yesterday with us today and we are looking forward to your address tomorrow as well. Thank you so much on behalf of Casey College, on behalf of HSMC University Mumbai, on behalf of all the participants across India who could get chance to uh, meet you, to listen to you, but they cannot uh, uh, clap because all are muted. So a big round of applause for you, sir, on behalf of each one who is listening to you today. Thank you so much. Thank you once again. We have with us today uh, Professor Satish Devdar, and we are looking forward to his talk. I request um, uh, Dr. Hiral Shet to uh, kindly introduce our distinguished economist and who specialize in agriculture, but today ready to talk on the reality, economic reality uh, with Indian perspective. Over to Dr. Satish Devdar. And over uh, to Dr. Hiral to introduce Dr. Uh, thank you, Principal Ma'am. Uh, I would just take a few minutes to uh, share a few instructions with everyone. Uh, I'm Ayushi Sharma from the Economics Department. Uh, so there are just three instructions that I would like everyone to follow. Uh, first is regarding the chat box. So uh, we would request everyone to use the chat box only to post their questions. Uh, this would help us to capture more questions that can be then asked to Dr. Deodar. Uh, so please just uh, stick to asking questions in the chat box. Uh, the, at the end of the session, uh, we will be circulating a form for your feedback. Uh, so the second one is regarding the feedbacks. Uh, so for the feedback forms like yesterday, we will post the link of the form on the chat box and display it on the screen as well. If you are unable to access the link from the chat box, we request you to kindly type the URL in your browser and access the link. The link will be displayed for a longer time today, so please do not worry about it. And lastly, regarding the recordings of all the three days, uh, so the, all the recordings will be shared with the participants after tomorrow's final webinar session. So yes, these were the three points that I had to make. Now, um, thank you everyone. Uh, uh, over to Dr. Hill Seth to introduce our second speaker of the day, Dr. Satish Deodar. Thank you, Ayushi. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Hiran Sheth here. It is my honor to introduce our next speaker for the day, Dr. Satish Deodar. He teaches economics at the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. He has a bachelor and master's degree from Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics and a PhD in Agricultural Economics from the Ohio State University, US. Apart from being the recipient of the Outstanding PhD Dissertation Award from the Food Distribution Research Society, USA, he has been honored with the Distinguished Young Professor Award for Excellence in Research by Indian Institute of Management in 2008, the Wang Mehta National Education Award for the Best Professor for Economics twice in 2012 and 2015 by Business School Affair, among many others. He was selected as the ULIT Fellow of the International Agricultural Trade Research Consortium for the period 2006 to 2008. Besides, he has conducted research projects for India's Ministry of Food Processing Industries, Ministry of Agriculture, Indian Bank and Economic Research Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He is an avid researcher and has to his credit number of national and international research paper publications and has authored quite a few monographs and books. One of his books, Day-to-Day -day Economics, has gone on to become a national bestseller 
in the non fiction category his latest book is titled economic sutra ancient indian antecedents to economic thought he was the pioneer of the annual computerized common admission test conducted by iim for admissions to the management school he has also held many administrative positions and currently chairs the food and agri business management program at iim i welcome you sir on behalf of the kc family to deliver your lecture on impact of covid 19 on indian economy and request you to begin with the session thank you for that introduction um, i am humble <laughs> uh my job actually has been made much easier by mr hiranandani because he has put the context right in place in crisp half an hour so uh, i think my job has become much more easier uh and as as we speak i think uh, uh, the finance minister is uh, laying down few more things and i think as time passes she more she may bring even more things so therefore what i'll do is i'll give a broader context uh rather than the specifics that will come out of the special economic package and what principles really guide in this should guide us in taking the economy or the covid problem forward um i have uh, made ppt presentation it's very risky to let a professor unleash on this webinar and he can go on and on so therefore i thought i'll anchor myself on a ppt presentation so let me share my ppt screen let me know if it comes out comes up now is this visible to all of you yes yeah wonderful okay so yes, uh, yes. what i what i'm going to do is the following uh, you know i'll divide my talk uh, synopsis into four parts uh, one is what's the origin reality of covid 19 i see that uh, i must admit that uh, we also are you know in the process of making all our courses online and till date i have not started my course yet because our students are in holiday they are coming back and once they come back i'm going to start my teaching so uh, this is a epochal event for me as well this is my first online uh, uh, teaching that's happening in front of and as i see as uh, we speak close to 300 participants are there so this is my first one so i'll remember this one uh all right so uh, i'll first talk about the origin and reality of covid 19 then talk about the short term and long term measures that i been taken for the corona virus itself and then i'll come back to economic reality of the covid 19 and what are the policy measures to counter the crisis right uh before we begin i think let me give you another motivation you know there are two kinds of dilemmas we are here with there is one doctor's dilemma that is choice among the patients just imagine yourself uh, that there is a small hospital somewhere in matunga and there are 10 beds and two buses come each bus has 10 patients and the doctors the police outside and the nurses they have a dilemma which 10 people from which bus you know they should admit to treat now assume that bus a has patients which are not that ill and and the bus b has 10 patients uh, which are seriously ill now if the doctors treat the patients from the first bus which has 10 patients all will recover but the ones in the bus b 10 of them they are very serious therefore only there is a 50% chance of uh, uh, you know recovering so which bus now they should uh, you know take uh, patients uh, for treatment naturally if you go by the objective that you want to uh, save more lives you will go with the bus a because all 10 will uh, get saved and if you choose the other bus only 5 will get saved right now if i change the story a little bit if i say let's suppose in bus a there are all aged people average age is let's say 65 plus and the bus b has average age of 5 or let's say i average age of 10 so young kids are there now your objective might change even if you save the people from the first bus all tell of them how many life years you are saving it may not be much but if you save the lives of people in the bus b maybe only 5 lives will be saved but life years saved will be much higher 
so the moment the uh, category of people changes your uh, decision changes let's suppose this was not a civil hospital let's suppose this was a private hospital and where they take patients who can pay the highest now only the rich will be able to go and generally old age people they have more savings with them so they will be able to bid the price and get saved so what i'm driving at is that doctors have a dilemma today of choice among the patients why is this happening because there are too many too few beds too few doctors and too many patients just like this doctors dilemma is there our government has a similar dilemma there is a choice between lives and economy do you save lives by lockdown or do you save economy by unlocking it right and these are i would say these are dharmic or ethical uh, decisions that government also has to make and that's where we are caught up uh, given this uh, broad background let me just uh, for just to repeat a little bit uh, you know where is the origin of this covid 19 as the name suggests covid 19 it is corona virus disease that came up in 2019 that is what who would like to uh, define it this as right and most of you as you would know that this is a, a disease of origin from china and how did this happen you know there are you i'm sure you have seen many uh, video clippings on whatsapp so there are uh, animal markets in wuhan and from bears to bats i think they eat lot many things as uh, delicacies and the virus that is there in those animals and birds might have carried on to uh, humans the second theory is that well wuhan in china also has this virology institute where they are doing a lot of uh, virus uh, um, trials now maybe that the laboratory safety standards they had were not as good as the international standards or the western standards and the virus leaked out from there now so far so good but had they informed everybody earlier enough we would not have been in the predicament that we are today i am told that the first case the case zero happened as way back is in november and when their own doctors tried to uh, tell uh, about uh, warn the uh, authorities they were silenced and perhaps therefore world got to know about this too much late and it was really late for us to do something about it you might have heard of italy's case why would italy get hit there are huge chinese foreign direct investments in italy and even there are many labor camps which working in italy and probably for this reason italy picked up this much faster than any other country what this is telling you is that we are living in an integrated world where diseases can spread like wildfire economists have never talked thought about these issues economists always think that international trade is better trading of goods services and labor all over the world is always better because things should be produced where they can be produced most efficiently and when they are produced most efficiently that means you are you are saving the world's resources so that has been the traditional approach that economists have been saying and therefore this in, in the integrated world the virus has spread very fast and certainly we are witnessing an epochal times we give examples in our lectures about black death in 14th century or plague that happened in around 1900 the way we handled these situation these epidemics or pandemics is extremely critical during the british time during the plague in the bombay presidency basically in pune and bombay the british government was extremely harsh and you know what happened the trafficker brothers had to assassinate the collector of pune uh mr rand so things can go to that extent so we have to be extremely careful right so the issue is how to handle this disease and how to handle the economy let me first come to the uh, handling of the disease itself in the short term what have we done as i talked about the doctors dilemma there are too many patients but too few test kits too few beds too few doctors nurses and ventilators so we wanted to buy time right if you go the chinese way there was alleged suppression of information heavy handed lockdown and there was no regard for individual rights in quarantine measures but we are a democracy so we had to handle it little differently how did uh, america handle it 
Well, Donald Trump's idea is to keep the economy going because their idea is that their healthcare infrastructure was large enough to handle the pressure. But as we see today, even for a first world country like US, their infrastructure could not handle. So it looks like the third option, which the Indian way was to have a quickly a lockdown so that you slow down the process of the virus catching. And in the meantime, because we lack the healthcare infrastructure, because we have high population density, and because we have low literacy rate, we had no choice but to have a lockdown. And in the meantime, build up our infrastructure and minimize the spread. Long term, what should we be uh, looking at? Well, of course, we have bought the time. And this time of almost two months has given us enough leeway to make create awareness among the people. I'm sure you have heard the stories, you have seen it on TV, how difficult it was for us to create the awareness itself. And we needed that time within the lock, uh, lockdown. Test kits, PPEs, that is the personal protection equipment, we are extremely short in, so also ventilators. Hopefully, by the time we end the complete lockdown, we will have developed the enough infrastructure so that more and more cases that they come, we'll be able to manage. Why is it that we, we are using the hostels of uh, colleges, we are using hotel rooms, is just to expand our capacity to handle the corona patients. Otherwise, it would have been, as Mr. Hiranandani said, it could have been by now, lakhs and lakhs of people would have suffered and we would not have any wherewithal to treat them. So therefore, this is the uh, lockdown we have had. And we have also asked private practice physicians to now offer their services. So we got enough time to get ready for the uh, corona pandemic. Well, the medium to long term is that well, one could develop cure for this uh, in terms of a drug. So international efforts are on. It may take months or years for the drug to come. And we also have a potential, whether it's ICMR or with our private institutions. Uh, the fact that hydrochloroquine was supplied by us at a very short notice the world over gives us a hope that we ourselves will come up with that drug. But drug is an ex post uh, treatment. There could be a possibility of developing a vaccine itself, and that is also going to take time. That's a preventive measure, right? Uh, once again, efforts are on uh, internationally, and it may take months and years. Till then, we have to be ready for a new normal. Deaths, sickness, and hotspot lockdowns intermittently are going to be a part of our lives, and we have to embrace it. What we have only done so far is given us time to build the infrastructure. And then now we can think of our economy as well, right? So let me come now to the economic consequences, the short-term economic uh, uh, reality of the COVID. Well, as I said before, politicals, politicians had to make a dharmic choice. Imagine if there's a war tomorrow, right? We lose lives and we lose economy also. There is no trade-off. We lose lives and we lose economy. And once the war is over, we know lives have been lost. Now we have to look at how to revive the economy. Let's suppose there was an earthquake. You know, lives are lost. But one, that's an exposed thing. And once the lives are lost, only thing we want to focus on is how to revive the economy, right? But the COVID war is different. We'll constantly be facing the trade-off of lives and economy. The moment we remove the lockdown, there is a distinct possibility that more people, more cases will come. But we have no choice because we want to run the economy as well. So this war is much different than the traditional war that we have faced. The immediate impact has been that there is forced reduction in aggregate demand. Many of the measures that uh, Mr. Hiranandani talked about, which government will also follow, they are addressed to create aggregate demand. So far, what has happened is all of a sudden, whether it's commercial transport, tourism, hotel, restaurants, weddings, education, you name it, there is lack of demand because you are just forced not to consume, not to go out. The moment demand falls, you know, it's a standard economic argument. How do each and every individual firm know that there is no demand in the market? Of course, retail sector will let you know that people are not buying. 
But the moment inventories start accumulating, that's a signal to the firm that, well, nobody is buying things. And the moment inventories start building up, it's a signal that there is no demand in the market and therefore firms will cut back on production as well. Third important factor this time was it was not just a choice of the firms to cut back on production because the labor itself was leaving. The migrant labor which wanted to go home because of the lockdown, right? So therefore, first there was a fall in demand because of lockdown. As a result, inventories accumulate and therefore supply also comes down. So here is a case where both demand and supply both have fallen down. As a result, incomes of the people have fallen down, right? As Mr. Hiradmindani said, I'll repeat, we always talk about GDP growth rates, right? Well, in the first three decades of uh, India, growth rate was absolutely low, maybe 3%. And if you subtract the population growth, probably only 0.5% per capita per annum. After 1991, it shot up for some period. It was as high as 8%, 9%, and then came back to 7%. Today, we are not talking about 7%. We are not even talking about 5% or even 4%, not even 3%. There's a distinct possibility that we may have a negative growth rate for a while because of this very specific reason that we had a lockdown and both demand and supply both have fallen down. So we should be ready for this eventuality. So therefore, what should be done? At the, the big picture of it is the following, and then I'll come to the micro details as well. The big picture is economists, we have lost innocence, at least for now. And being an economist, I'm saying this up front, we always assume that there are proper institutions in place. And therefore we say global supply chain will increase welfare of the society but it also assumes that we have dependence on foreigners. And it also assumes that if there's a war, there will not be a war, terrorism, or any natural calamities. Today, is it a natural calamity or it's a biological warfare, whatever it is. Today, we have realized that too much dependence on foreigners can be a big problem. US has learned it firsthand and eventually we'll also learn uh, about it. So therefore, the economist's assumption that in the world is one country, and therefore we should have efficient production where efficiency is need not necessarily hold in this new in the new light the assumption is that we require all countries to be transparent in their dealings i'm sure in your coffee table discussions or in, even in your academic discussions you must have heard stories well your friends go to china they stay there because you have a subsidiary firm there you have gone there to procure something and while you are there in china you can't read the Times of India on the internet. You have to read whatever China tells you to read. We have heard so many stories. You know, there is a prison labor. There is a population, a floating population of people who are not registered in population registry because for so many decades, second child onwards, there should not have been any family. And therefore, if you have a second child onwards child, children, they are not registered. They are available at cheap rate. Now, all these things that we have been informally talking about it, right? Now, people will start questioning, why should we then have international trade when there is no transparency, there is no fair dealing? And this was just hush talk talk for, for now, but with COVID coming from that side, now things have come to the fore. Think one more time. We have another, th uh, another point to think about. We also need to look at global environmental security. Why is it that India, India should consume kiwi fruit which comes from 10,000 miles away from Australia? When somebody buys a kiwi fruit in India, you know, as a uh, gourmet food item, maybe it is very expensive, but why should we consume it when it's coming from 10,000 miles away? You are creating ozone layer in the process. Eat locally. Whatever is available, make merry when there is summer and eat mangoes. But you don't necessarily have to have kiwis from Australia. Or you need not necessarily have guacamole coming from Mexico. In the process, we are spending humongous amount of fuel to transport. We are creating ozone holes. So therefore, even from an environmental perspective, we have to take a real look at whether globalization of this kind is really required or not. So therefore, for uh, nature's sustainability also, I think we have to take a real look at this. 
So reduce the carbon footprint. You know, look at it on the, in a different context again. India is a country of continental proportions. Do we have deserts? Well, yeah, we have deserts. Do we have rainforests? We have rainforests. Do we have Himalayan alpine forests? We have those things also. We have uh, humid areas. We have dry. We are a country of continental proportions. And therefore, whatever economists talk about efficiency in production through international trade, consider free trade among 29 states of India. Let the organic food come from Northeast. One of my students who won a recently a prize from our prime minister, she runs, uh, she's an entrepreneur. She's running a Parvata Foods uh, company. She gets organic food from Northeast of India. It's completely organic. And that's what people like, she'll get it from there. So consider India as a continent and we have a free trade among ourselves so we can achieve it. So whatever Prime Minister talked about, uh, you know, uh, he used the term uh, self-reliance. So I think, I don't know, the, uh, he used the Indian uh, Hindi term for it. I think that certainly makes a sense. So we can have efficiency within our economy itself. Why plastic, fertilizer, drug molecules, atomic plant, machinery, and in, in fact, even Diwali lanterns and Ganesha idols are coming from China, right? Imagine the same Ganesha idol is creating environmental hole, ozone hole. So please, you know, do it, do it ourselves. I think this we have come to realize because of this COVID uh, pandemic. Let me go a little further. <clears throat> we have been part of WTO. And we talked about uh, you know, WTO negotiations, freeing the agriculture trade, non-agriculture trade, lowering of custom duties. We have 50% custom duty on import of apples. And there is a strong lobby which is saying that reduce your duties on imports of apple from US. I think this is the time for us to tell WTO, don't talk only in terms of efficiency of production of incurred costs. What about environmental cost? Why do I want an apple all the way from Washington state of US and create a ozone uh, hole? We very well could buy it from Kashmir, Himachal, or even Uttaranchal. So these are, I think, so therefore, we may not want to go against free trade, but we need not commit any further lowering of custom duties. And let status quo be maintained and try to increase our competitiveness. Now, there is a talk about our subsidies being too high on food rations. I think we'll have to continue on that, no doubt about it. And we can give an argument that food subsidy is meant for the poor in India, and therefore there is no chance that we'll reduce subsidies any further. Same thing will apply to IPR laws. Of course, because of WTO now today, we have product patents, not just process patents, but product patents as well. And we need to honor patents, sure. But if we can give, hydrochloroquine at a short notice to others when it was banned for export. I'm sure others can reciprocate and we can produce foreign drugs at cheap prices in India too. For the time being, the IPRs could be uh, rescinded for some time for sure. And hopefully the 20 uh, year period might pass uh, for many of those drugs. I'm sure you have heard of uh, what has happened to the petroleum prices. No, it's again the same story. First, there is no demand for it because nobody is traveling. Probably people are not fighting as well. And therefore, there is no demand for petroleum, oil, or any products. And therefore, supplies also come down. Prices of petroleum price are extremely low. I'm sure you might have heard that there's a negative price for petroleum sometimes because countries cannot even stock up their petroleum. There are many hundreds of ships now floating on the seas, just carrying petrol or the petroleum products. And therefore, it may be a strategic thing to, for us to do to procure petroleum at much cheaper price today. I'm sure you have heard of uh, US having huge stocks of uh, petroleum. Probably this is the time for us to make huge strategic stocks of petroleum. And where do you stock it? Maybe to some extent you can enhance your capacity, but however, what in US they do is what which your mines, coal mines, which are not being used today, are converted into stocks for the petroleum. Maybe something similar we can think of. I'm sure somebody in the government might be listening to this. We must increase our strategic stock of petroleum, especially when prices are so dirt cheap. This will not mean certainly though that our retail price of petrol and diesel should come down. This is a good way. We are used to a certain price level. 
maybe 65 rupees to a liter at the retail uh, gas stations let that price remain as it is because use we are used to it the difference because of the input price being very low that coming from outside can be utilized significantly to lower our budget deficits because we are going to need lot of government expenditure which i will come to on other other uh, sectors and that can be um, we can manage that through this price difference in the petroleum product to continue <clears throat> let's uh, look at other macro aspect <clears throat> most of the foreign exchange reserves and fortunately india has huge reserves close to i think it varies between 400 to 500 uh, billion dollars this foreign exchange reserves and most of the global foreign exchange reserves are held about 60% or 62% is in terms of us dollars and now slowly but steadily it is crawling in terms of renminbi also that's the chinese currency but when us and china are at war i mean trade war and it might lead eventually you never know to which war we are talking about it's good idea to increase our reserves in gold because values of foreign currencies may tumble and therefore we may want to have more reserves of gold instead and that is something as a strategic decision we may want to think through restrict automatic fdi i think there was yesterday some announcement up to 200 crore rupees there will be no uh, fdi coming in but uh, indian phones will be given access uh, to bid for the government projects up to 200 crore rupees and maybe uh, to some extent selectively we can figure out that uh, for temporarily we need not allow fii or fdi in certain critical industries why i say this is because because of the crisis stock prices are very low and when stock prices are very low i have heard that some chinese companies are buying quickly bonds and stocks at very dirt cheap price and they attempted to do that in india as well so i think from a strategic perspective also we need to take a, a good look at uh, this foreign direct investment let me come to now fiscal policy and monetary policy when economists talk about monetary policy what are we really talking about whenever there is lack of demand and therefore projects are not going up therefore unemployment is there you want to increase demand in the economy and therefore more production will come through how do you increase the demand you want to increase the demand of two kinds consumers should consume more and at the same time firms should also invest more and what is the cost for the firms it is the interest rate so given their rate of return on different projects if the interest rates come down firms are likely to invest more and therefore an expansionary fiscal uh, expansionary monetary policy for the reserve bank of india would mean that repo rates and repo rate is the rate at which banks can borrow from rbi those should go down uh, in the near past you know our rates have been very high compared to rest of the world so we have still a lot of flexibility to reduce our rates further in us in japan in many other countries there is something called as liquidity trap their interest rates are so low they can't go anything lower for us at least we have that luxury of lowering the interest rates they should come down so that even small and medium enterprises uh, should get loans at a cheaper rate i must point out uh, yesterday a lot of uh, uh, talk was there about giving loans to uh, small and medium uh, sm uh, micro small and medium enterprises without collateral there will be a moratorium for first year to repay the loans that is wonderful however one doesn't know what are the interest rate that we charge i hope the interest rates are also very low and that should be part of a broader expansion in monetary policy where repo rates will be lower another way of increasing money supply is that government uh, reserve bank of india buys gold which i talked about earlier and pays through by printing money and at least for short duration if that happens when it pays by printing more money that money goes in the hands of private traders and banks and therefore they have more liquidity and therefore banks will also give more loans hopefully at a lower interest rate so it will be a win win situation for us certainly therefore there should be a expansionary fiscal monetary policy generally people argue that expansionary monetary policy may lead to inflation but that's less likely to happen here whenever there are ex there is excess capacity whenever production is not taking place and you give incentives through lower interest rates to produce more 
there is less chance of inflation setting in. In fact, demand will go up, production will go up, but prices need not necessarily go up. And therefore, we should follow expansionary monetary policy. Let me go to the other uh, policy, which is called as fiscal policy. When government talks about uh, 20 lakh crores uh, support to uh, the nation, basically we are talking about fiscal deficits. If government is going to shell out money, where is it going to come from? Either it comes from taxes, that's one way, but that is not possible because actually we want to reduce taxes. The other way is to borrow from the public. That's a possibility, but borrow from the public would not necessarily mean public like you and me. It could be institutional investors like LIC, which receive a lot of premiums every year from us, general insurance companies, which receive a lot of premium from us. And it could be the external borrowings. Fortunately, again for us, our debt GDP ratio is not very high compared to many other countries from Europe. More importantly, our foreign debt as a percentage of GDP is less than 5%, much, much lower than many other countries in the world. Therefore, we have some leeway of borrowing from outside world as well. So that's the uh, fiscal policy for you. Expansionary fiscal policy would mean that you incur budget deficits through borrowing and then spend on goods and services I think uh, Mrs. Sitaraman may spend a spell out today or maybe a few days later. There has to be a massive infrastructure projects. I'm sure Mr. Hiranandani would be looking forward to helping the nation, whether it's uh, highways, whether it's uh, housing for the poor, whether it's rail networks. We need to create assets through these deficits. Government itself could finance them. And as long as we are creating uh, productive assets, which will last for the next 50 to 100 years, and to generate employment, there's no chance of inflation. So that will be a win-win situation for us as well. Let's look at a few other uh, less important things, but a little long-term uh, requirements. Let's shift eventually our attention to renewable energy. In WTO, US has been going after us for manufacturing the photoelectric cells. They talked about the patent issue. They talked about subsidies given on the photoelectric cells. This is the time for US to give us back. We gave them photo, uh, the, uh, the medicine at a short notice. They need not trouble us on subsidies being given to manufacturing of photoelectric cells. We need to quickly move to electric cars or many other things that run on electricity. It will be environmentally sustainable effort. Again, we can justify this in uh, WTO negotiation. I remember my childhood. I'm sure you remember your childhood. Once in a while, my mother would ask me to clean the soil nodes with serve detergent. And I would merrily do it because after cleaning those nodes, it, they would look so fresh and nice and I would even press them. They would look exactly new. But you know, there was a much, uh, the other side of it was that means in those were soil. Imagine how much of unhygienic elements are there in our notes. We want to move to digital currency. I think demonetization helped us move a little bit. The corona crisis should also help us move in that direction a little, little bit or maybe uh, by a leap uh, ahead. Let's try to avoid using soil notes or notes, physical notes for our currency. Let's try to have Paytm. Let's try to have Rupay. Let's try to have debit cards more but let's not have circulation of these physical currency, which can also accentuate uh, contagious diseases, including the present one, the corona. So this is a time for us to make a, a, a digital shift. I'm sure most of the companies are bleeding. Their EBITAs are just not looking good. EBITDA is basically earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. If you want to take care of this, I think yesterday's announcement has taken care of most of these issues. Moratorium on interest payments, I think that has happened for the first year. Loan guarantees government is giving. And wage subsidies in construction, food processing firms may be required. Labor has left the work. To bring them back, we'll need to do a lot many things. One of the things would be to attract them with a higher wage and probably one of the ways would be that government itself also gives some wage subsidy for the construction workers. GST slabs have, will have to be lowered and let's not get into the nitty gritty of which 
product to be reduced by which rate? No, there are zillions of products in this country. You cannot have this nitty gritty in place to decide for every product what should be the GST rate. Just have a thumb rule. 28 becomes 18, 18 becomes 12, 6, 5 becomes 0. You know, those kind of things, if you have easier ways of adopting, of lowering of GST, that will be much nicer. Economy will get a boost. I think uh, this has not come through. Maybe we should allow higher depreciation for three years so that cash flow does not become an issue and uh, firms can have some profit for themselves. This must be done immediately. The announcement, there is always a policy lag and there is always an implementation lag. Policy looks like has happened now. I hope there is no implementation lag uh, for doing this. Now let me come to the domestic industry and support. I think most of these things I'm talk, going to talk about uh, may uh, have already been discussed for, because we are talking about MSMEs here. For migrant labor, no, one of the issues is that, you know, I think Mr. Hirandhanani mentioned that you know, they did not have enough cash to eat. There was no food. What happens is you have, your domicile may be in Bihar and therefore your ration card may say that you're listed in Bihar, but you are working in Mumbai. How do you get your ration? So there has to be universal access to ration shops so that there is no hesitancy on the part of workers to go wherever they go for work, but they will think I'll get my food wherever I go. And that is, I think, very important. Maybe for first two months, give it, if not free of cost, I'm saying free of cost, but at least half the price so that workers return to work. That is very critical. I think what uh, the UP government has done, it should be done by everybody else. Rajasthan had already done. Amend the Factories Act, amend Industrial Disputes Act to allow labor flexibility. Now, the moment you say this, you know, there are liberals and others in the country who will say that, no, you're not protecting the rights of the workers. But look what happens. The experience till 1991, till the pre-liberalization period was, that because there is a factory act, if, if my workers go beyond 100, then I get into certain uh, uh, condition by the government. And then if I, there is lack of demand, and therefore I want to close my shop, I'm unable to close my shop, I have to keep paying my workers and I bleed. Now, if this is the condition, a firm will not come into the market in the first place. Why should I start a big industry? Because then I'll be faced with these problems. And therefore, flexibly, if there is free entry, there should be free exit as well. That's the economic principle. If there's free exit as well, people will venture and go into industries. Otherwise, they will not even go into industries. Why our SMEs remain SMEs? Because the moment they grow big, a lot more conditions come into play. And therefore, they won't, don't want to grow big. So I think what UP government has done should be wonderful especially if the migrant labor has gone back to UP, probably they could be quickly absorbed in local industries there itself. And that's a good move, which all uh, state governments should uh, do it. In agriculture, if there's a shortage of supply, I know Israel has done this wonderfully. There could be drone-based spraying of pesticides and broadcasting of seeds. A uh, few experiments have been done. We should look at this very carefully so that uh, migrant labor who has left or labor which is not there right now on the farms, that, for, that problem could be taken care of. Second, we could increase the retaining capacity of the farmer. I saw today some pictures where farmers are waiting with the cotton that is uh, recently harvested and they are waiting for trucks to send it up, uh, to the towns. But for other food products, so there could be village level mini dal mills which have been, uh, you know, uh, developed by Ikrisat in Hyderabad, so that farmers can process their produce locally itself. They need not therefore depend or throw their products outside because there is no transport available. Hopefully these uh, measures will also help the farmers. Let me look at a few other issues now. Um, how, much, how much time I have? Uh, I think I'll just spend, uh, we could spend more time probably on the question and answers as well. Let me just give you two more slides and then I could uh, stop, I suppose. On health, on corona related issues, you know, one important fact that has come to light is and our healthcare spending, Government of India's healthcare spending is barely 1.5% of GDP. We are no more a third world country. We may have a sizable population of the poor, but we are no more a third world country. We are a developing country 
and I would think soon we'll be going into a middle level, middle income country as well. Our healthcare expenditure has to go up substantially, and that that's not that's going to help the poor. Civil hospitals, primary healthcare centers. If these things develop much faster, even awareness about health issues that's extremely important. Our expenditure. Uh, as a percentage of GDP on healthcare must uh, grow up from medium to long run. And this is again a little uh, global uh, thing I'm talking about. Look who are suffering more from Corona and who are dying because of Corona. If you have diabetes, I'm not a doctor, I'm a, hum I'm a harmless doctor, <laughs> but if, I were, if I'm, not, I'm not a uh, phys uh, physician, but I know that those who have high diabetes, high blood pressure, suffered from cancer, or you have obesity, you are the candidate for getting corona. So therefore, in the long run, we need to, why, does it, why is it that in Italy, more retirement homes are getting corona and people are dying? I think over time, society has lost its ability to take care of its older generation. Hopefully, India could regain its values and we should treat our old people at home or at least have, do not uh, you know, have uh, uh, homes for them where nobody looks after them. And second, health is most important. I think organic has become a uh, flavor of the month, but I think in the long run, we, want, we, we may want to go organic. These chemical pesticides that are being sprayed left, right, and center are creating more cancers. Sugars whether high, car high carbohydrate diet is creating obesity and therefore uh, uh, diabetes. Our lifestyle has to change. I'm glad that uh, Mr. our prime minister has talked about yogasana. If you don't do yogasana, you can take a uh, you know, morning walk in Shivaji Park, whatever suits you well, but I think that's lifestyle has to change in the long run. If you want to avoid pandemics like this, Good health of an individual is extremely important. I think uh, Ayush ministry should focus on these things. I think that should be part of our 5% GDP spent on healthcare issue. Now, let me just conclude by the last slide. I'll talk about improvement in our competitiveness. It is not that uh, our prime minister is also not saying that we should look inwards. It's not that we want to have nothing with the rest of the world. It's not that we are talking about an autarchic situation, but nobody prevents us from increasing our competitive advantage. Nobody prevents us from incre increasing our competitiveness. Mr. Hiranandani talked about ease of doing business. Certainly that has gone up, but it could go further a few notches. And two important other things I would like to mention, and then I'll stop. One of them is there has to be inventiveness and inventiveness in the society will come when business and academia interact with each other. So I'm, in my uh, school days, I talked, uh, I heard, I read about modern temples of India. 300 odd research institutions were created in India, but they worked in silos. I don't know whether you know this, but there is a poultry research institution in Hyderabad. There's a potato research institution in Kufri. And there are so many institutions working in isolation. Scientists are working there, but they don't have research students because it's not an academic institution and they wait for government funding to come from Delhi. So they have become academic babus. What needs to happen is there has to be interaction between business and academia. And as a result, what has happened, because there are these 300 institutions supposed to do research, universities are not doing research. Universities have just become teaching institutions. This will have to change. How will this, and because, and because of this reason, Firms know that we don't want to hire PhDs from universities because you don't have good uh, researchers. Why should I hire uh, somebody if he's not going to contribute to my R&D uh, R&D activity of my uh, firm? Because in the long run, I want to earn profits. So what is the change is that there should be competitive grants. Different universities must compete for competitive grants and let the best uh, proposal win the grant, and then he has, he or she can do the research. Similarly, most of these 300 or research institutions should be turned into universities where interdisciplinary research happens. A poultry research researcher in Hyderabad should also know something about the potato research happening in Kufri. And he should have PhD students who are the cheapest source of research. So that interdisciplinary research has to happen within universities. And these 300 or research institutions should be converted 
into academic institutions where PhDs are uh, hired and they can also therefore turn out their, their products, their students who are employable by the private sector for their R&D initiatives. I say this because uh, two years ago, I had the opportunity to interact with Mr. Um, um, Baba Kalyani and a few others. Uh, I was in Pune and uh, I interacted with a few of the um, CEOs. They said, we don't hire good researchers because we are not confident that they'll contribute to our research. And therefore, Baba Kalyani was sending some of his engineers to IIT Mumbai to get further education. Now, this situation has to change. Secondly, one last point and then I'll stop. 45% uh, of our GDP is locked in public sector enterprises. Value of assets of the public sector enterprises are 45% of our GDP. This is unbelievable. We must have this investment and private sector should come in. Mr. Baba Kalyani was giving me an example. During the Kargil war, Bofors guns were extremely effective, but at the short notice, they wanted, they wanted to replenish the stock. They came to uh, his company and they supplied at a very short notice, but they never get the contracts. So I think this situation has also, so the architecture of procurement, government procurement for defense industry has also to change. I'm sure today or tomorrow, uh, government is going to make a few announcements. And these kind of announcements will also help the domestic industry to grow. I think uh, I should stop here. Uh, we should have more uh, probably room for questions and answers. Uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Satish, sir. It's really, you covered almost all topics. And uh, now I will call Hiral to talk. Hiral, please. Uh, everybody is tired. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. They they are just enjoying it. Yeah, please, Hiral. Hello. Can I see that questions are there ready? Uh, yes, sir. Ah, yes. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Satish, sir. Uh, we uh, we have there's lot of uh, room of room for thought here. Uh, especially when we look at uh, self-reliant Bharat that was uh, given by our Prime Minister uh, 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 two days back. So, uh, sir, we have a few questions uh, uh, for you um, uh, that we received in the chat box. I will, I will post them one by one. Do you just read them aloud because there are too many I can see here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I will. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. I will do that. I will okay. do that. Okay. So, uh, sir. Um, so we have a question that does being a self-reliant Bharat mean that we will go back to the pre-globalized inward-looking economy? Uh, no, certainly not. I think uh, there is always a tendency for that to happen. As I said we need not reduce, uh, increase our custom duties. That means we are not going, we are not against trade, but nobody prevents us from increasing our competitiveness. We can improve our competitive advantage through technological changes, what Israel has done, right? So the situation should be such that we have enough investment into R&D and therefore we come up with our own products and therefore others will need our products. Right? So it's not that we don't own products from the rest of the world, but we should gear ourselves better. So I'm not saying that we should uh, have completely inward looking uh, policy, certainly not. Uh, okay, sir, um, on this line, we have another question where uh, uh, it's been asked that going from vocal to local products, but what about countries whose major income comes from foreign trade? 
Yeah, so as I said, you know, we are fortunate that we are a continental country and therefore we can trade amongst ourselves. For countries which are very small, of course, they, I mean, uh, for example, Hong Kong, Singapore, they produce nothing, but they are only uh, intraport countries, right? So there'll be always some uh, trade taking place. And for that, those countries will have to specialize only in that intraport activities, right? They need not necessarily produce much. Uh, that's, that should be fair enough. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, sir, um, there's a question where um, uh, uh, we've been asked that, do you think Indian economic recovery will be U-shaped, V-shaped, or L-shaped? <laughs> L-shaped meaning you're saying we'll stay flatter continuously. L-shaped certainly we don't want. Uh, V-shaped is tough. I think it will be certainly U-shaped because... Uh, uh, V-shaped means that you suddenly start growing. That's certainly not possible. I think it's going to take at least a few years for us to come back to normalcy. But what is important, as you know, Adam Smith said, that it's not the stationary state. Uh, it's not the growth, but the stationary state is melancholy. We don't want stationary state. That's melancholous. We want to grow. As long as we may start from a lower level, but continuously we'll keep growing, and that U-shape, I think, will stay with us for some time. Okay. Thank you, sir. Or may I, may I add, uh, or is a tough shape, you know? <laughs> there has been question also always, uh, which comes to your mind, whether it is V-shape, U-shape, or tough shape. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, sir, uh, there is a question on uh, rural schools. Uh, so, do you think government uh, should open schools in rural areas where kids go to schools not only for free education but also for their midday meals? So, oh. Yeah, so um, as you may know, there is a midday meal scheme by Government of India uh, in tandem with the state governments. And a uh, few years ago, I did a paper on midday meal scheme. Uh, we should increase the size of midday meal scheme, especially for landless laborers, daily wage earners. It's extremely difficult for them to keep their kids in a day school, uh, in a uh, kindergarten or whatever. So therefore, uh, government schools will certainly help them come to the school. That's the first thing you want to do is to attract them to the schools. And uh, if you give one good meal a day, I think nutritious meal a day, that goes a long way in helping their nutritional security. So I think this should certainly go up. Okay, absolutely. Yes, sir. Um, so regarding the WTO, uh, where you'd mentioned about WTO commitments and the role of WTO. Uh, so we have a question that if we freeze our WTO commitments, will not the advanced nations like the USA drag us to the dispute settlement body? And if they do, Will we be able to stand the economic cost at this juncture? Are we really prepared? Well, good question. Uh, you know, this, the argument applies to all countries. I'm sure US will also have other issues where they would like to hold back. So I'm sure each country would like to hold back at this time. So therefore, it's not that difficult. If you had asked me the same question or if India was to do this uh, four months be, uh, prior to this, it would not have been possible. But today it is possible because each country is thinking in these terms. First priority is to uh, save the local jobs. And therefore each country will be probably more amenable to this than before. And it is not that we are saying that we will increase the custom duties. We are not going further increasing the uh, protection. We are just saying we will retain the protection where it is. We may not further increase the liberalization, but just stay put where we are. And that should be fair enough. Okay, yes. Um, so coming back to the migrant laborers, uh, uh, you mentioned about them and uh, that uh, how states should uh, employ them. Uh, sir, but there is a question regarding this, that uh, if the migrant laborers are going back to their home states, uh, what will be the impact on employment in these states plus the wage rates? Will the wage rates go down in, the, in those states because there will be... Um, more laborers available? Uh, this is something that will evolve. Um, you know, fortunately, sometimes having high unemployment rates comes as a boon in disguise. 
let's say take a case that in in maharashtra there is unemployment and if the migrant labor has gone back to up and now because of the uh, liberalized uh, factory act and the industrial disputes act in up if the migrant labor finds job there itself the unemployed people in maharashtra might find job in mumbai and elsewhere so i think because there is a unemployment already in india this adjustment might be easier uh, what will happen to the wage rate uh, it's a good question each state has a minimum wage act and therefore wages will certainly not fall below the minimum wages that are specified in each uh, state now to what extent it gets violated that's another story but each state has a minimum wage act and therefore wages will not certainly fall below the minimum wages correct um, thank you sir uh, sir we have few more questions like uh, now we have a flood of questions you <laughs> decide uh, how many more you want to take <laughs> so it all depends on you we are ready to uh, uh, so we want to listen to you as much as we can okay uh, sir uh, it's regarding banks so do you think the npas of the already struggling banks uh, would increase since banks have to now give more credit to smes uh, 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 without collateral well uh, regarding the banks we are caught uh, at the wrong time because government was really you know there is uh, something called animal spirits you know uh, uh, john maynard keynes talked about what is called as animal spirits uh, when there are some defaults some few individuals are uh, uh, going uh, doing things illegally and therefore if government goes after them it it's good thing to do however it creates some uh, lowering of animal spirits others start wondering whether i should invest or not why is government going after few people right but nipping them in the bud was for example the uh, government going after the choksis and the modis uh, i'm talking about the other modi right neera modi <laughs> it's important to go after them to nip them in the bud but if you don't do it there'll be a bigger problem much later right so we are trying to nip things in the bud however this corona virus has come and therefore it has complicated our matters much further but certainly the government giving uh, you know uh, assurance that they will not require any collateral for the new loans would mean that uh, nbfcs will be ready to give loans and if for the first year there is a moratorium on payment certainly government has to back this up right and if government does back this up and therefore in the first year the firms need not pay Uh, repay their loan after taking the loans the installments to that extent there will be more incentive for banks to give loans uh, and hopefully as the lockdown ends firm would start would like to start their production and therefore they would like working capital and they will certainly go to the banks and ask for it so i think this will uh, come back to normal okay okay sir um and sir uh, if them there are many questions regarding what is please unmute sir please unmute sir yeah myself yeah uh, i request the host uh, to un yeah. sir um so can you hear us yes yes uh, okay sir uh, there are many questions regarding uh, the future of e-commerce like what do you think will that look like you know uh, <laughs> good question uh, i'm not an astrologer <laughs> but you know you can say we are astronomers <laughs> so i think future certainly is in e-commerce uh, we want to have less and less um, physical handling of things and uh, e-commerce seems to be the future especially the jandan yojana i think it was a wonderful stroke of uh, imagination by the prime minister uh, how would you know whenever government gives transfers you know for now 2000 rupees uh, that are given to the farmers direct cash tra- when you give direct cash transfer is always going to be a leakage right and not all politicians are uh, straight forward or should i say the other way around right but uh, you know therefore Uh, how do you ensure that money goes in the accounts of the individuals direct cash transfer is co- practically based on e-commerce internet banking and that will certainly help and that is the way forward uh, i don't see we going back on that for sure uh, 
even in these times you might have experienced certainly in the town in the cities uh, we are making pem whenever our grocery store opens you know i give the order on whatsapp and the guy is delivering and i am making a payment by paytm i think this has minimized our contact not in just not just in terms of maintaining hygiene but in terms of efficiency also things have improved therefore so i think that's the way forward for sure uh yes sir absolutely uh, uh our prime minister even mentioned the success of jam jandhan yeah. aadhar and mobile in his speech and that has really helped uh, uh, uh for them to make payments to uh, to rural workers so, absolutely yeah sir uh, moving on on this point itself we have a question that if we believe that we have surplus food and we also see that families of daily wage workers in villages are going without food for days so um, what would be the best way to reach out and deliver this surplus food to them uh, yeah. we are making uh, so money is reaching them but what about food yeah so the, the issue is about distribution right and for the first time we have used stocks uh in fact it is in the interest of the food corporation of india to quickly get uh, to quickly dispose of their stocks because uh, if you talk to a food scientist he will say that if you store grains for more than 2 years the nutrition quality also goes down it is not just about the storage cost but the nutrition cost is also involved and therefore we the turnover of the uh, stocks has to be higher earlier what used to happen is they were centrally stored so grains go from hinterland all the way to the storage centers and once again from storage center they are sent back for retail distribution so our mode of distribution has to change there should be more silos at the local level itself in fact if you go about um, you know 70 80 years back in time our village system itself had storage capacities but because we went into the us model of high use uh, silos centralized silos and therefore we started storing food grain centrally and therefore we started incurring cost of transporting grains from hinterland to the storage centers and back again for distribution i think that model will have to be changed as we uh, that will be part that should be the part of the new deal that government is offering creating infrastructure there should be huge uh, silos created at the village level itself and that should be public pure public goods created by the government so that food is stored at the local level and therefore transportation cost will go down and therefore access to landless laborers access to the uh, urban poor should also increase and i think that should be the way forward okay all right so um maybe one or two more and then we could stop <laughs> sure sir sir would you like to pick up from the chat box or i should uh, let it? me see we can uh, just have you look at them yeah yeah there is a question i think eva madam uh, wanted to say something yeah oh, yes no no it's okay let, let's uh, answer the questions okay yeah i see one question on borrowing right so fiscal deficit and capital account yeah so uh, one good thing is that uh, in the last two months our uh, current account deficit has come down because we are not importing from outside so that is a good thing for us our current account deficit is very low uh, regarding budget deficit i think uh, mr hirandandani also talked about uh, the frbm act uh, those who recall frbm is fiscal responsibility and budget management act frbm act and which talks about uh, reducing our fiscal deficit to 2.5% of our gdp by 2023 and there is a leeway of leeway of 0.5% given on either side when there is a recession you could increase to 3% or otherwise in the normal year it should remain 2.5% by 2023 however uh, the current crisis is much different i think we'll have to have another amendment to frbm act that government should be allowed to go beyond uh, 3% in fact even currently in 2000 uh, 20 our fiscal deficit is about 3.5% of the gdp so there is no way that we will further go down to 3% now it will have to go up so amendment will have to be done to the frbm act that we should be able to increase our fiscal deficit maybe to 5% 6% and that should be allowed 
And I do not think that should be inflationary as long as we create infrastructure. I think Mr. Nitin Gadkari has a big plan of huge road infrastructure around the country. If that happens, we are creating assets for the next 50, 60, 70 years. And when asset creation takes place, there will be more mobility of labor, more mobility of uh, industrial products, more mobility of agriculture products. And therefore, inflation will never take place. It will only help the economy. So I think budget deficit should not be a worry as long as we create productive assets. So in, for example, the Gujarat example, when chief, current prime minister was the chief minister for Gujarat. Close to 80,000 farm ponds were created. And as a result, growth in agriculture was substantial in Gujarat. So I think that model could be replicated elsewhere. Good opportunity for constructing farm ponds all over India. And that's the infrastructural investment where government should come in. And that will help farmers in a big way. So fiscal deficit need not be a worry, even if it becomes 5% or a little higher. At this time, that need not be a worry. Yeah, with okay. moderator permission, can I ask one question? Yes, moderator, can I ask one question? Oh, sure, sure <laughs> sir, please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sir, uh, what do you think in this pandemic situation, this migrated labor will come back to the metro cities? Yeah, so as I said, some, some of it will certainly come. It may take time. Uh, but there will be a realignment possible. Now, if UP government is saying that, you know, we have amended our Factory Act and our Industrial Dispute Act, more factories may come in the UP itself. So some of the workers may get absorbed locally itself. So unemployed youth from the hinterlands from Maharashtra might come to Mumbai, right? So there'll be a, a different alignment of uh, supply of labor, but shortage will be there only in the first few, one, one month, I suppose, in the transition period. But otherwise, that should not be a worry. Uh, I think that rural area that is MG Narega will take care of. Yes. If, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So level. when I talk about infrastructure, construction of uh, farm ponds or farm uh, or rural roads, that's where the Mandrega will come into picture, certainly. Yes. Very good point. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Emma, madam, want to talk something? No, I would only say that, uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Ravi, but uh, I would only say that. Uh, uh, to, to Dr. Satish Dedaji that uh, it was a fabulous talk. Uh, I mean, it was a, a quite detailed presentation, but lucidly presented. And I think uh, the, the key uh, takeaway, uh, one word which I will take away and which makes the basis of the, uh, the, the uh, call uh, of the Prime Minister. And uh, when Modiji sir said that uh, uh, we want self-reliant India or it is Atam Nirbhar India. I think one key takeaway from your talk was that you touched upon various issues, whether it is, uh, uh, I mean, a message to universities or to financial institutions that is time uh, to be, uh, to have indigenized uh, uh, India. And one word is indigenization. So I think uh, uh, it is very, very important where the research is concerned. We need to look back and uh, be resourceful to our nation and uh, even in prospect, uh, where are we headed? We need to be innovative. We need to understand that we can contribute to our students and to this nation by uh, encouraging good research and being innovative and st strengthening R&D. So I think a fabulous uh, presentation, uh, uh, Professor Dedhar, and I will look forward uh, of you having with us uh, in Mumbai and praying that um, quickly uh, we come back to track. Uh, and of course, we are going through tough times but uh, we uh, always, I, I think that uh, we, our humanity, this particular, I mean, all of us, uh, we have always uh, uh, fought many battles and we have always been winners. So this also will uh, pass by and uh, uh, very soon uh, we will, instead of digital uh, discussions, there will be one-to-one -one discussions and we will invite you to the new university, uh, which is the Justin's University, and we would want uh, you to present your impressions and your work on agriculture economy. So a lot of things you touched upon and I could see with a lot of uh, you know interest you presented that with the drones you talked about and I was just let me thinking that so much you have to give and one and a half is not sufficient for you. So we would want, we would host you back in Mumbai sure. very soon and uh, uh, we will hear from you and meet you. Thank you so much. Uh, and it was a very, very informative talk.
my pleasure thanks to also to you personally and dr darje and uh, dr damle who really initially met me and talked to me and uh, so thank you all of you for giving me yes. opportunity thank you yeah i just one minute sir i will call hira to say something hira hira is there hira said sir i will Uh, yes. yeah well, you can continue yeah, yeah. please continue uh, thank you dr deodar uh, you've been really patient with all our questions uh, thank you very much sir for an engaging and enlightening lecture on the impact of covid-19 pandemic uh, on the indian economy uh, covid-19 pandemic has been an unprecedented situation and uh, challenge uh, before it's a challenge before all countries of the world including india uh, your lecture has uh, covered the impact or uh, the impact of this pandemic on india's uh, economy thank you very much sir i i express my gratitude to dr niranjan hiranandani for making time for us today as well uh, despite his busy schedule uh, sir presented his insightful analysis of the pandemic and passed every conceivable angle of the current catalyst to find answers to questions that simply won't go thank you so much sir for this thought provoking lecture i also thank our beloved principal dr himlata bagla for her constant support and encouragement i thank all the participants teachers students and research scholars from across the country for their enthusiastic response to this webinar we will again meet tomorrow at 3 pm thank you thank you sir thank you very much thank you so thank you once again each one of you and of course the, uh, the team uh, are led by dr ravi uh, so big thanks to the department of economics for organizing this webinar and all the participants who patiently heard and uh, they posted the questions so be very participant audience tomorrow as well looking forward to meet you all tomorrow 3 o'clock thank you so much and once again thank you, thank you, thank you dr. dr thank you sir bye now bye now thank you sir thank, thank you so much bye bye, bye, -bye.